Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the last couple of weeks, we've been reading a portion of Paul's letter, second letter to the Corinthians, where he's asking them to prepare an offering to help the poor from the church in Jerusalem. Paul's been reminding the Corinthians of their legacy of generosity in the past and their good intentions in the present. And he's been using the Macedonian church as an example and a motivation for them to be generous. In this week's reading, though, Paul gets down to the theology of it all. The why. What is it about God and God's relationship to God's people that should spur these Corinthians to be generous givers, to treat their resources differently than others do, or from the status quo in the world around them. To answer this question, Paul uses the metaphor of gardening or farming, the metaphor of sowing seeds and reaping a harvest, which many of you, including Jen, know a lot better than I do (laughs) what that's actually like. This is a particularly fitting metaphor for the season we find ourselves in today. I neglected to mention last week in worship that it was Canadian Thanksgiving. And of course, in just over a month's time, we will be celebrating American Thanksgiving. And as long as you have a Canadian pastor, you're gonna have to hear about this stuff. So I'm sorry about that. But this is a season where we are focused on gratitude, blessing, bounty, and harvest. But there can be no harvest without first sowing, without planting seeds and tending to their growth. The old adage, you reap what you sow, is a true one in many ways. And although it is often used to warn people against treating others poorly, lest they be treated the same way down the line, Paul reminds us that the metaphor works in the other direction as well. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But this is not just simple math. Sow less, reap less. Sow more, reap more. In some ways, yes. In important ways, yes. And yet there is more to it. Today we're digging into this metaphor and considering how our trust in God's provision for our lives shifts the formula for us. How it frees us up from a life of calculating to a life of releasing blessings into the world. The idea that our harvest will be bountiful in proportion to the number of seeds we sow is a logical, sensible one. The point Paul is making to the Corinthians here is that they need to give of what they have to put their resources out there in the world so that the resources will grow, bless others, and in some fashion or another, come back to them in high proportion. What would stop anyone from doing this if they could? What might prevent someone from giving generously? I can think of a number of things. High on the list is fear of not having enough. Whether it is money, time, or energy we are being asked to give away, the question might arise for us, if I give too much away, will there be enough left for me, for my loved ones? Even if we truly believe that in giving we will receive, we might still struggle with taking that risk, with giving over what we know we have now in the hopes of an unknown future return. Another reason someone might not give generously is because they are being pulled in too many directions. Demands on money and time and energy require careful calculation to make sure we don't overextend ourselves. Yet another is the fact that in giving of what we have, we are at least to some extent 
releasing our own control over the outcome. That's scary. What if the recipients of our generosity are ungrateful or manipulative or take advantage of what we give? What if the seeds we plant refuse to grow and just die in the ground? As poetic as it sounds, most of us have lived long enough to know that Paul's exhortation is not as straightforward as it sounds. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Unless the weather doesn't cooperate or the pests ruin your crop, or your neighbor steals your harvest, or life happens and you don't have time to water and weed. I see these struggles the most clearly in my own life when it comes to how I spend my time, or how I am or am not generous with my time. Anxieties around not having enough time to do all the things I feel I need to do have sometimes prevented me from sowing the seeds of time spent with friends, or time spent relaxing and restoring, or even time in conversation with God. But when I haven't taken the time to sow and nurture these seeds, to be generous with my time amidst my fear and anxiety of not having enough time, then the harvest can be sparse when it comes time to collect. Not only have I denied my friends and loved ones the gifts of time, but in those seasons where I have not been generous with sowing the seeds of my time, the harvest of support and restoration and clarity turns out to be lacking when I need it the most. And yet in those stressful moments when I am faced with the decision about how to spend my time, how generous to be with it, whether or not to give it away, to friends, to God, or to rest, sometimes the risk just feels too big, the payoff too uncertain, the other demands too heavy, the loosening of control too intimidating. Perhaps you can relate, whether it's with giving of your time and energy or being generous with your financial resources, Perhaps you can relate to the fear of not having enough, the feeling of being overextended, the discomfort of surrender, the possibility of disappointment, or fill in the blank here. We all have reasons why we are not as generous as we could be. That is why we need the rest of this passage to help us see how God makes a difference in this whole question. According to Paul, God does not want for us to be generous under pain of guilt or compulsion. Rather, Paul says in verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. Yet God does not expect us to simply put on a happy face and empty our pockets. God loves a cheerful giver, but God also creates the conditions for our cheerful giving. God makes truly cheerful giving possible. How? Because, as Paul goes on, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. What might happen to our fear of not having enough or our worries about control and disappointment if we believed that God would always provide enough of everything? If we were able to trust that as we give what we have, God would not leave us empty and stranded, but would continue to bless us abundantly. And not only that, but bless us because of and through our giving. Would this change how we thought about giving? Would it allow us to be less afraid, less reluctant, and begrudging and more cheerful? Part and part of the good news of the gospel, our salvation in Jesus Christ, is just this. God loves us so much that God was willing to give everything, even God's self in the person of Jesus, to heal and and restore our relationship with God. The God who loved us enough to do this for us promises to be ours and promises that we are God's. 
to care and provide for us no matter what. The source of our blessings is infinite, and we need not fear that those blessings will run out. But there's more. Moving from fear to trust, from a scarcity mindset to an abundance, abundance mindset, is made possible as we believe God's promise to provide for us. But that's kind of straightforward, and that may not be that easy in our own experience of it. It's not like flipping a switch of belief. We all, we all have either ourselves experienced or known or have heard of people who are completely down and out, for whom money or time or the fortune of good health has run out. These misfortunes are not a sign that we or they lacked faith or that we or they didn't give enough. Paul's teaching that if you sow abundantly, you will reap abundantly is not a formula for wealth and prosperity. The gospel does not come in with an easy fix to our worries. It comes in and transforms our whole perspective. Our passage today ends by saying that God will provide you with every blessing so that by always having enough, you may share abundantly in every good work. Then it goes on to describe what that good work is. God scatters abroad. He gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Indulge me while I continue with the first verse of next week's reading. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Trusting in our infinitely generous God is not about having a sugar daddy in the sky. Because the harvest we have been promised is not a financial one, or at least not only a financial one. It is a harvest of righteousness. It is a harvest of participating, or as the scripture says, sharing in the good work of God. The scope of which is so much broader than the balance of our bank accounts and includes justice and provision, not just for a few, but for all. Yes, as we release our blessings into the world, sharing them generously with others, we will receive blessing upon blessing in return. But that blessing will look like different things. Some might indeed find that their financial well-being does increase as they are generous with what they have. This allows them in turn to give more, to bless others, and the cycle repeats. George has allowed me to share with you a powerful testimony about his and Ruth's experience of giving. He said to me years ago when I was not as close to my Savior but still believed in God as a matter of habit, we used to decide to increase our church giving every year as a matter of routine. Even as I was not as close to my Savior, I started noticing that as we were increasing our pledge and giving, we were getting more, which I attributed to coming from God. Now, George shares, he and Ruth are intentional about being cheerful and joyful in their giving. He said, more recently, we have not increased our pledge and have decided to give a special gift to the newborn baby Jesus on his birthday which we will plan to do again this coming birthday. While for some, blessing might come in the form of financial increase, for others it may come in other ways, in the blessings of new and healthy relationships and friendships, in the experience of community, in a sense of peace, an appreciation of simple pleasures and moments of beauty, in freedom from trying to live up to the world's standards, in seeing the world, or at least our little corner of it, become a more just and welcoming and kind place, and knowing that we have been involved in making it so. Friends, in this stewardship season, we are asking you to prayerfully consider how you will commit to the ministry of TUMC in 2023. We ask, I mentioned this at the beginning of the service, we ask that you fill out an estimate of giving card, which most of you will have received in the mail, or you can find them here at church, and bring it to worship next week on October 23rd. 
And we are going to bless our commitments and generosity next week because they are worthy of blessing. As you continue your discernment, I ask that you remember that the God who has brought you thus far and who has brought this church thus far is able to provide us with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in the good work that God is doing. To reap, we must sow. But God provides us with all the seeds we need to collect the bountiful harvest that God has intended for us. May we give as though there is and always will be enough. Amen. Our hymn of